Welcome to Captain Bang Presents Colonial Chesapeake on a public bacon special. Today's special is Colonial Chesapeake, which included what is now Virginia and Maryland. This location was not an optimal choice because of the swampy lands which bred diseases such as malaria and typhus. Not only were the colonists in swampy territory, but 80% of homes were located just half a mile from riverbanks, making it easy for wealthy plantation owners to build wharves to ship their produce from. Most gained this wealth through head rats, which is a paying of passage for servants, for 50 acres of land per servant, and producing tobacco, the staple colonial Maryland and later Virginia. Originally, Virginia was not meant to grow tobacco, but to plunder for gold and conquer natives. After this, in an attempt to turn Virginia into a trading post failed, they turned to tobacco. Now Maryland had always focused on tobacco. Within four years of colonization in 1634, they exported 100,000 pounds of tobacco. In 1640, that number rose to 1 million pounds of tobacco grown jointly by Virginia and Maryland. This demand brought in large revenues, but it also widened the gap between the rich and poor. The differences between were very stark, where the wealthy had luxurious homes and comfortable living, while the poor lived in destitution. A typical family would live in a 16 by 20 foot shack with three mattresses, a barrel, a chest, two pots, a kettle, a gun, and some books. Pretty sparse compared to the needs of a family. These colonists left England for a better life only to arrive to poverty. Many of the indentured servants, working for the owners, couldn't get escape their servitude but remained in poverty as the fall of tobacco in 1660 went to a penny a pound. This caused much stress in the colonies, along with the Religious Toleration Act and the Bacon's Rebellion. With many of these conflicts not even delved into, we must begin at its inception between Lord Baltimore and King James I. Before Maryland's colonization, King James I awarded his trusted friend and Secretary of State Lord Baltimore, the charter for a piece of land in the New World in 1632. Lord Baltimore was given this land and given the freedom to do whatever he wanted with it, making it a proprietary colony. Lord Baltimore named Maryland after the king's wife, Queen Mary. Baltimore, Maryland got its name after the proprietor himself. This colony was free of taxation and the crown could only control war, international trade, and the elected assembly that approved all of the laws that were made. Maryland was made as a Catholic refuge, but that was even pointless as Protestants made up most of the population. This reenactment shows the transaction of the charter between King James and Lord Baltimore. Enjoy, because I'm Kevin Bacon and this is a public bacon special. Hello. <laughs> In 1649, Lord Baltimore drafted the Act Religious Toleration. This act made Maryland the second colony after Rhode Island to affirm religious toleration. However, this act did not separate church and state, and the government was still allowed to punish religious offenses such as blasphemy. Also, anyone who denied Jesus could be sentenced to death. Mm. So, no tolerance for Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, deists, or Wiccans, or Pastafarians. This act was seen as a precursor to the First Amendment. This act was meant to improve relations between Protestants and Catholics. <laughs> However, in 1654, Protestants barred Catholics from voting and got rid of pro-tolerance Protestant Governor William Stone. So, nobody but intolerant Protestants are allowed to have rights. Now, let's take a look at Susie, the blasphemous knitter, because I'm Kevin Bacon, and this is a public bacon special. It's just a little old me, Susie, making my sock on a Sunday. <laughs> Working on Sundays. <laughs>
blasphemy. <laughs> you knitted on a Sunday. You're gonna die for Jesus. Oh no! In 1676, tensions were high between the Indian tribes and the English settlers. Governor of Virginia, William Berkeley, suggested building a big fence to keep the Indians out. But with the hard economic times, small farmers preferred the cheaper option of exterminating the Indians. Nathaniel Bacon became their leader and defied the governor and led 300 men on a massacre of all the Indians they could find. All peaceful. He returned in June and demanded the authority to wage war on all the Indians. Enemies were considered any Indians who left their villages without English permission, even if fleeing attack. Then Bacon's men were allowed to pillage from these enemies. Governor Berkeley realized that he shouldn't have let Bacon's 1,300 men slaughter the Indians and call them back. They forced him to run away across the Chesapeake, and the rebels burned down Jamestown. Jamestown sure is bacon now. Bacon's men allowed people to live if they joined the uprising. But as soon as he won this battle, Bacon died of diarrhea. In late 1676, and his followers disbanded. Now this folly in government led to the Treaty Middle, Middle Plantation, which was a royal commission dispatched from England in 1677 that found that Governor Berkeley didn't handle Bacon's Rebellion properly. And that land taken by the English had been promised to the Indians by past treaties. So the Treaty of Middle Plantation was made, and under it, the tribes and the colony pledged to be peaceful, and the tribes were granted their land perpetually. Let's go kill the Indian. Mm, well, wasn't that interesting? I'm Kevin Bacon, presenting a special Bacon Report, and I hope y'all enjoyed it, because I'm Kevin Bacon. See ya.